the uh, subject the subject of today's medical grand rounds vaccine myocarditis is one that is topical and, and I believe relevant to all clinicians and indeed to all citizens as we're nearing the second year of this pandemic and we are truly privileged here today to have a guest speaker with us, uh, Dr. Liu, who is arguably one of the leading experts on this subject. Um, now, this is an outline of today's presentation and uh, Peter and I have agreed that I'll, I'll give a bit of an introduction and a case before he take, takes on his presentation. And I thought it would be worthwhile to just understand the concept of SARS-CoV-2 as a cardiac disease. and. Uh, when we consider that the mRNA vaccine was specifically engineered to express the surface protein of this virus, it then becomes easier to understand the pathophysiology of mRNA vaccine myocarditis. So I thought we could begin with an examination of how the coronavirus uh, has evolved in the way it infects humans. And um, <clears throat> So the coronavirus is, was first identified in the mid 1960s. And typically they were considered to be harmless propagators of the, of the common cold. And in fact, I think until SARS came along, that's really all we, the coronavirus, the rhinovirus, we didn't really think a whole lot about it. Certainly there wasn't much apprehension about it. And the coronavirus would con had constituted about 15 to 30% of all common colds. Now, since that time, we've seen additional novel uh, coronaviruses that have jumped from other species. And there's some, it appears that the SARS virus back in 2003 came from, from the bat through the civet cat to humans, the MERS virus through the dromedary camel. SARS-CoV-2, I'm not even gonna go there. It's become very controversial and political as to where it came from, but we can speculate. But nonetheless, I think what's, what's true of all of these is that, first of all, the acronym itself, it's acute respiratory syndrome. In fact, it was felt to be a, a, a respiratory pathogen. And we understood that it uniquely targeted the ACE2 receptor. But even with that, we only saw about 0.5 cases per thousand of clinical myocarditis with SARS and with MERS. And somehow SARS-CoV-2 is uniquely different. And we, we have seen a, a real propensity of cardiovascular and thromboembolic events with, with this new and novel uh, coronavirus. <clears throat> I thought this was an interesting slide because, you know, when, when we go back, when I go back to my own training and, and even recent reading, and we, we think about what are the causes of viral myocarditis, this is a review paper by Pollock from 2015 in Nature Reviews. And if I draw your attention to the top left corner, it lists the various viral agents that cause uh, myocarditis in humans. Coronavirus is not even listed there. So quite clearly, this is a fairly recent phenomenon with SARS-CoV-2. And this is just a depiction of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus with the uh, surface spike proteins, nucleocapsid, the RNA uh, within the membrane. Um, and some of the, some points that are worth considering is the spike protein was in, is unique to uh, to coronaviruses generally, but something some mutations have occurred that have increased its affinity for ACE2, and even more so than what we saw with with uh, SARS and MERS, and part perhaps because there's an ability to to block effective cross neutralizing antibodies, and the significance of this is that with uh, with COVID nineteen we have seen. Uh, in hospitalized patients, we've seen elevations of troponin T in 20 to 30%. And indeed, patients that are in ICU, typically universal elevations of troponin T. So quite clearly, cardiac involvement is a major component of COVID-19, particularly as patients become ill. And indeed, elevations in troponin T are, are a signal of poor prognosis as well. So with that, and again, I, I think it's worth reflecting the, the great challenges that we've had to, to manage a disease that, that basically appeared out of nowhere. It was a, a, a novel disease that was spreading widely, filling up our ICUs, yet we didn't understand what it was, how it spread, how to manage it, 
what organs were affected. And I have to really congratulate, and we, are, we owe a great debt to, to those early investigators that began to unravel the clues that led to some understanding and some effective treatments for, the, for COVID-19. One of those is with us here today, and this is a this is a review paper in circulation from last July that was uh, first authored by Peter Liu and his colleagues that looked at how COVID-19 specifically affected the heart. And I think we're all quite familiar with, with timelines with COVID-19, viral exposure, the onset of symptoms, and then severe disease, usually at, at day 10 or 11 to 14 with ventilation and later with a resolution. <clears throat> And, and Dr. Liu and colleagues nicely outlined how the timeline of where troponin elevations begin, accompanied by myocardial injury, by vasculitis and coagulopathy. A little bit later on, by a few days, begin to see, begin to see elevations in NT pro BNP, indicating higher diastolic pressures, higher risk of heart failure. And of course, we're familiar with cytokine storm and the effect that that has later on. So with, with a dysregulated uh, immune response to the virus. If we jump ahead another nine months, this is a paper from, from the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Mina Chung and colleagues that, that looked at it you know, with the benefit of another year of data and, and, and uh, further research and and really tried to bring, and again, I won't get into the details here, but I think there are some salient points that come out of this review paper. And I've already mentioned the, the, the greater capacity for binding to the ACE2 receptor. And further to that, there's, a, there's an enhancement of cell-to-cell -cell fusion and spread of SARS-CoV through the body once infection has taken hold. And we know already that this has increased further with the various variant strains that we've seen now, I think it's worth considering as well that the ACE2 receptor density is higher in patients with cardiovascular disease. So essentially presenting a far greater number of targets for the virus. Uh, and it may explain why patients with, with hypertension, with heart failure, with diabetes have, have uh, worse outcomes in COVID-19 than the general population. And one other point to speculate on is the role of, of myocardial injury in the pathogenesis of long COVID. And there's a number of, of uh, CMR studies that have come out uh, that have looked at uh, the persistence of myocardial abnormalities for several months after infection. And uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Lou may touch on that, but, but again, the final answer isn't out, but it's certainly an, an important point to consider. Now, in this same review paper, there's, and again, this is after, this is in uh, April of, of this year, and we've the benefit of one year of experience, it shows that there are still many more questions than answers. And we, when we zoom in a bit on the cardiovascular effects and the causes of them, it's somewhat unclear whether this, it's mediated through direct effects on the ACE2 receptor, whether an element may be simply hypoxia-induced injury or microvascular thrombosis, or just a general inflammatory response that affects the heart. And then later on, we know that there's some uh, dysregulatory effects that may cause sort of an autoimmune reaction in some patients as well. And indeed, there's some papers that have dealt with that recently. So, with that, I'd like to just move on to a case report. And this is a patient, this is the only patient that I've seen that with mRNA vaccine myocarditis, or what I believe to be that. And I thought it would be a good segue to our feature presentation by Dr. Liu. Um, so this is a relatively young woman. She's 24 years of age, uh, a legal secretary, healthy and active. Her the only medication that she had been on was the birth control pill. She had no known allergies. And like a good citizen, she had her first shot of the Pfizer vaccine in May of this year with no issues. And because of the supply demand issues, she, her second shot was Moderna in July. And she got that on July 13th. Five days later, she noted a headache, a pyritic rash on her arms and legs. And then three days after that, she awoke with quite severe pleuritic chest pain that radiated to her shoulders, to her left arm. And she came to the emergency department where I was on call and saw her. Uh, she was a febrile emergency, temperature 36.2. She was tachycardic with a heart rate of 110. 
Uh, mildly hypertensive as well, blood pressure 141 over 90. I could not hear an audible pericardial friction rub, but we did note that her troponin levels were elevated 131. Her D-dimer was elevated as well at over 1,000. White blood count was high normal range. <clears throat> so we did a CT chest to make sure she didn't have a PE and it was negative for PE. Um, Heart, pericardium, and pleura looked normal as well. So there were no clues from the CT chest. Her ECG, which I will show to you shortly, showed sinus tachycardia, but not much else. An echocardiogram showed uh, a very slight reduction in LV ejection per action of 54%, a trivial pericardial effusion. And nothing dramatic, but given that her signs and symptoms resembled that of acute pericarditis, we managed her that way. Um, she got high dose aspirin, 650 milligrams QID. For, she took that for a month. She took colchicine uh, 0.6 BID for three months. This was her electrocardiogram, which, as I mentioned, shows a sinus tachycardia, but none of the characteristic ST changes that one might expect with pericarditis. I did follow up with her in September. Then again in October, uh, when we repeated her echocardiogram, um, she was asymptomatic at this point. Her ECG had normalized. Her echo showed normal LV function. I didn't really see any sequelae. We had a conversation about whether or not, um, <clears throat> should there be a mandate for a third uh, shot, whether she would be, wh whether that would be a contraindication for her. And I'd be interested in Dr. Liu's thoughts on that. So with that introduction, I'd like to hand over to our uh, esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Liu, to, to shed some light and to lend some clarity on this important subject. But before I do that, I do wanna just uh, introduce you properly to Dr. Liu, who's currently the Chief Scientific Officer, Vice President of Research at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He's a professor of medicine and physiology at the University of Toronto and Ottawa. He's the former scientific director of the Institute of Circulatory and Respiratory Health at the Canadian Institute of Health Research, president of the International Society of Cardiomyopathy and Heart Failure, and the inaugural director of the Heart and Stroke Lure Center at the University of Toronto. Peter received his MD degree from University of Toronto and did his postgraduate training at Harvard University. His lab investigates the causes and treatments of heart failure, the role of inflammation and identification of novel biomarkers and targets for intervention in cardiovascular diseases. Peter has published over 390 peer-reviewed articles in high-impact journals and received numerous awards in recognition of his research and scientific accomplishments. He has chaired scientific sessions at the Heart Failure Society of America, the International Society of Heart Research, amongst others. And he's a champion for knowledge translation, integrating the cardiovascular prevention guidelines and healthy heart policy in Canada and internationally, including the sea change guidelines. And on a personal note, I have known Peter since my cardiology training, and I consider him to be a friend and a mentor, and indeed instrumental in my development as a clinician, as a researcher, and as a critical thinker. Peter, it's indeed an honor to have you here today as our guest speaker. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. And that was a wonderful um, uh, segue uh, in terms of the uh, case that you presented. There are some very interesting features, particularly the combination of vaccine that she received. And of course, the background that you have presented, that's actually really up to date. And thank you so much uh, for doing that. And you can see that I will, uh, in fact, reflect on some of that uh, during our discussion as well. And it's certainly an honor to be here. and. Uh, um, I see that uh, there are a uh, number of friends that uh, uh, know, uh, you know, and uh, worked uh, together before, and uh, so this is wonderful. And of course, uh, it's a particularly uh, pride for me uh, to be able to uh, be here to uh, share the podium with uh, uh, Dr. Lefkowitz. You know, Dr. Lefkowitz uh, is famous not, you know, because of his cardiovascular accomplishments, but in fact, as you know, uh, folks know that the most recent. Uh, uh, stories on uh, uh, COVID, for example, in Toronto, and in fact, on the cover of Toronto Life uh, is Dr. Ariel Lefkowitz. And this uh, obviously, you know, is uh, one of the heroes that uh, uh, kind of look after so many patients uh, during this uh, pandemic. And so the question is always, you know, does this uh, just uh, 
come by accident to this amazing uh, individual who's so dedicated. But of course, we know that this is not uh, really uh, by accident. You know, the apple does not fall too far from the tree, and uh, it's really <laughs> a tribute to his father as well, who we are so proud of, and I'm so proud to be associated with as well. So this is uh, just a fantastic uh, uh, story. And uh, so just in terms of the background, uh, uh, Chuck, in fact, has already covered this, so I won't uh, spend too much time on it, uh, except from the middle uh, down is that, uh, you know, um, even though uh, the mRNA vaccines are so effective, it's just amazing transformation uh, in terms of how uh, medical science has changed the face of the pandemic. Uh, but the uh, signals in terms of potential inflammatory heart conditions began uh, in March. And the first uh, signal come from Israel simply because they are first out of the gate and the massive vaccination efforts. And uh, so that uh, CDC uh, noted cardiac inflammation in May. And uh, in fact, uh, the report from Israel began to appear uh, in the May and beginning of June. And uh, as a result of that, the Canada Chief Science Advisor, Mona Niemer, uh, has uh, convened an expert panel, and I was uh, very fortunate to be a member of that panel to actually deliberate, you know, in terms of understanding uh, this uh, uh, risk associated with the uh, vaccines. So as a result, we actually looked up uh, all the data, and this is uh, around the July, uh, from the World Health Organization as well as CDC, and uh, then independently, you know, with the Israeli uh, colleagues to actually trying to get uh, some uh, glimpse in terms of uh, this uh, uh, situation. And so indeed, when we, uh, for example, look at uh, the WHO data and uh, compare to baseline of myocarditis with the regular flu vaccine, uh, you can see that in fact, the, in fact that the mRNA vaccines do have increased risk. And uh, so the Pfizer is uh, uh, increased, but particular Moderna, uh, you know, is uh, the signals is much higher than the Pfizer. And we'll talk about the possible reason, uh, you know, uh, later on in the, in the chat as well. And in addition, when you actually look at, for example, just the, in the early phases of some of these uh, uh, cases being reported, keep in mind that these are volunteer reports. So uh, there is a potential, you know, some uh, reporting bias uh, you know, embedded in these uh, data, but nevertheless, it gives us a good, uh, a glimpse in terms of what might be happening. And so we noticed that it's certainly more common after the second dose, uh, you know, very similar to the case uh, ET that uh, Dr. Levko was uh, uh, presented. And uh, uh, ECG majority is not specific as I mentioned earlier, but some actually do show ST elevation in this particular series, you know, a quarter of them do show mild ST elevation that tend to be transient. Uh, elevate troponin exactly as presented. In fact, uh, uh, two thirds have elevated troponin and that's been consistent. And our current uh, registry uh, shows the same proportion as well. And a small proportion of uh, patients may have decreased left ventricular ejection fraction as a bit of a hint of that, you know, in the case that's presented and generally about 10% of patients will have uh, decreased ejection fraction. And uh, uh, there are serious complications. In fact, about 1% uh, mortality in most series. So that seemed to be pretty consistent, but usually individuals would have other underlying conditions to predispose to that. And uh, keep in mind that the tamponade can happen with patients with uh, pericardial effusion. And uh, this is uh, one of the reasons the patient may require ICU and the prolonged hospital stay. And if we actually look at the, the uh, demographic features, and this will be a very consistent theme as we look at the, the patient population, look at the age distribution and also sex distribution. So if we look at the, the left or upper uh, panel there, uh, you can see the very tall orange bar in the second uh, column. And you can see that uh, that's in the age uh, bracket of 18 to 29. And uh, also the orange color are males and versus uh, yellow are females. And so there is a, a very high propensity of younger men uh, having the myocarditis uh, complication. And uh, this is uh, uh, similar, uh, if you then look at panel B, which is to the right, uh, comparing myocarditis to pericarditis, uh, you can see that it's really uniquely to myocarditis that one see this age and uh, sex distribution, whereas pericarditis tend to be more evenly distributed uh, through the various ages. And in terms of main symptoms, chest pain is the most dominant one as 
the uh, case that was uh, presented. And, uh, but uh, then others include fever, elevated troponin, shortness of breath, uh, chills, you know, very much features uh, of uh, inflammatory response. And uh, so this is uh, um, uh, generally, you know, how these cases are picked up. And uh, in addition, uh, so this is, uh, yeah, so I think uh, just on the second box there on the bottom in terms of fatal outcome in different series, uh, generally about 1%. And these, uh, as I mentioned, tend to be, however, the older patients with comorbidities uh, that can actually succumb because of uh, the added uh, uh, challenges you know, to the patient's uh, condition. So if we compare, for example, vaccine-induced myocarditis on the left column versus the conventional biomyocarditis, there are many similarities, you know, including, for example, pattern more common in males, younger uh, patients, and uh, the frequency is still lower compared to the conventional viral myocarditis, and particularly later on we'll present, uh, compare to the SARS-CoV-2 myocarditis, which uh, uh, Chuck very much uh, uh, elaborated on. Now, in terms of antigenic trigger, there may be actually some interesting aspect to the vaccine-induced myocarditis, and very much uh, you know, similar to what Chuck mentioned, uh, because the reason that mRNA vaccines are so effective is because they generate huge amount of spike protein in a very, very short time. Plus the mRNA that actually is uh, part of the transcriptional agent, but also is an immune adjuvant. So that's why it does such a good job in terms of uh, activating immune system. But then of course, it may actually come uh, with a bit of a price. And the symptoms as I mentioned earlier, and the uh, diagnosis, uh, we'll uh, talk about momentarily the Brighton criteria that includes uh, biomarkers and imaging. So the outcomes uh, generally do well. And uh, certainly we know that 80% uh, of the patients recover without any sequelae. And uh, the only question is some of the patients with potential long COVID-like syndrome. And of course there is the small proportion of patients who do have uh, much more serious uh, uh, presentation. So the Brighton collaboration are uh, folks who are particularly interested in vaccine related complications. And so they have come together to uh, at least help to define uh, myocarditis so that we can compare uh, different databases. Uh, but it's a fairly strict criteria. You can see that for definitive cases, which is called the level one uh, evidence, will require either a myocardial biopsy, which is uh, very rarely done, I have to say, and uh, or um, combination of biomarker and imaging abnormality. Then you can see there also is a fairly high bar, and a very few uh, individuals, in fact, have so-called confirmed or definitive myocarditis. But much more commonly is what we say suspected or probable case of myocarditis. You know, similar to the case that was uh, presented. Uh, in this case, you just need. Uh, the symptoms uh, that's uh, compatible, but also uh, any one of these abnormalities. So the most common one can be the uh, elevated biomarkers, the troponin or CK, and uh, imaging abnormalities. So this can be echo or MRI and uh, or uh, electrocardiographic uh, abnormalities that uh, uh, we talked about earlier. So majority of patients will actually fall into this cat category. And there will be other patients who present just with very classic symptoms, but none of these are elevated. So they are then usually classified as a possible case and uh, without any further you know, uh, objective um, confirmation. Uh, a nice paper, uh, I think the you know, majority of the nice data on this, uh, particularly with the Pfizer um, uh, myocarditis uh, comes from Israel because they are able to capture uh, the national registry. And so this was uh, published at the end of September in the New England Journal, and uh, in which they compared uh, the vaccine-induced complications versus SARS-CoV-2 induced complications. So the vaccine-induced complications are in blue color, and uh, the SARS-CoV-2 related to the complication are in orange color. And uh, we can kind of go through a couple of these and that's uh, kind of confirm how we generally regard these uh, conditions. So for example, if you look at uh, acute uh, kidney injury and that uh, the vaccine does not actually induce that uh, certainly, uh, but on the other hand, it's very common in seeing uh, in patients with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection for the variety of reasons that uh, uh, Chuck mentioned earlier in terms of uh, pathogenesis. And similarly, cardiac arrhythmias or myocardial ischemia infarction, uh, we don't see that uh, specifically with the vaccine, but however, is uh, definitely elevated with SARS-CoV-2 because it is a vascular myocardial uh, 
uh, ultimately disease, uh, systemic disease, likely because of the ACE2 uh, receptor involvement. And, uh, but on the other hand, when one look at the myocarditis, one can see that uh, the vaccine uh, does actually induce certain levels about three times compared to a control uh, population or before the vaccine was rolled out uh, versus uh, in the setting of SARS-CoV-2, the risk is about 10 times. So I think this is the uh, data that suggests that uh, at least in the majority of the patient population is still worthwhile to give the vaccine, even though we do know that, that there is a you know, small increase in risk of myocarditis because getting COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is way worse and the consequences are much more uh, dire. And uh, to follow up on the government uh, data, which it was just published, uh, I think about three weeks ago in the New England Journal, another update. And I think it's very nice to really confirm some of the earlier data because now, you know, we have uh, 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 millions of uh, uh, the population being vaccinated. And you can see that in terms of the development uh, of uh, uh, symptoms of vaccine-induced myocarditis, most commonly takes place about three days after the delivery, but keep in mind that this is quite common after the second dose. And so that it occurs about three days uh, following uh, the exposure, again, much more common in males versus females. And also in terms of the um, uh, age uh, cluster, uh, you can see that uh, the age cluster, again, male in blue color uh, uh, predominates and uh, the largest group are in the 20 to 29 uh, group. But however, um, younger uh, patients are also seeing 16 to 19. And so of course, this does raise the interesting question, what happened to the pediatric group, which you know, we're now uh, very much uh, uh, considering uh, delivering the vaccine and the US is starting that already. And of course, this is uh, data that's being very carefully monitored uh, as these policies are being uh, implemented. Uh, so the interesting aspect is a possible mechanism, and there are as many smart people, you know, with uh, mechanisms. And uh, I know uh, Chuck mentioned some of them earlier. And uh, so one, uh, so one thing is uh, definitely for sure is that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, concentration is a factor because it is uh, very much in that time window we saw, and as well the mRNA vaccines produce uh, uh, spike proteins higher. Uh, actually, than the SARS-CoV-2 infection itself, and simply because of the fact that uh, you know we deliver a whopping dose of mRNA very quickly, and it's those related. And I think this is actually very important to keep in mind. You know, we saw already epidemiologically, Moderna, you know, have uh, much higher risk than Pfizer, and we'll actually visit this uh, momentarily because the, the patient uh, that you present has a particular feature of risk there. So the reason for this, interesting, is the Pfizer contains. 30 micrograms of the mRNA uh, versus Moderna didn't want to take any chance putting 100, uh, oh, sorry, micrograms, apologies, micrograms of mRNA. So uh, more than three times. And interestingly, you know, the risk of just on that, uh, you know, first dose is actually three times with the Moderna versus Pfizer. So the day, those definitely have something to do with it. Now, the other thing that's interesting is the memory trigger, the prime boost strategy. So much fewer of these are in the first dose much more common in the second dose. I think about 60 to 70 percent are in the second dose. And so, uh, and the exposure is very fast. So you really suggest it's a recall phenomenon. And, uh, but then the other thing, which is very interesting, and this is brand new data, but uh, this is uh, relevant to the question that uh, Chuck posted on the uh, case, that is that what about the interval between the doses? So it is very interesting that the longer the interval, the less the chance of the second dose myocarditis. So in fact, if you go beyond two months, uh, the, the risk of significant decreases. So the longer interval is actually an advantage and may give us an open window how to deal with boosters. And then in terms of uh, sex interaction, very you know, predominant in males. So, um, so there's obviously interaction there, question whether testosterone is a playing a role. And there is obviously age related to the phenomena. And we know that the immune response is much more attenuated in the older population. That's why they need a booster now. But at the same time, uh, they have much less myocarditis. And the interaction with ACE2 uh, very much already elegantly uh, underscored by uh, Chuck uh, likely plays a major role and uh, particularly is targeting the cardiovascular system as part of the uh, complication. 
And uh, if we actually look, for example, the pathology, there's not a lot of data on it, but certainly in the New England Journal, there are cases of patients who actually died from the condition. And if, when you actually look at the heart, you can see that it's actually a fairly classic myocarditis with the um, myocytes being infiltrated by inflammatory cells consisting of many macrophages and uh, uh, some T cells, but it's in fact many macrophages. And so that this is def definitely direct uh, uh, inflammation, uh, bringing the uh, inflammatory cells into the myocardium and directly causing myocardial injury, uh, likely accounting for some of the troponin release and the abnormality seen on the uh, MRI. Um, so I want to say, also underscore that genetics probably have a role as well. And this is a wonderful kind of a story uh, that's actually uh, taken place in the US, I think it's in uh, Arkansas. And so here's a 22 year old uh, uh, male who received the second dose of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, shot on, uh, in uh, April. And the, the first dose is uh, exactly three weeks ago. And then he developed severe chest pain, not surprising, came to the emergency department, found to have a severe uh, pericarditis, but also troponin rise, SD elevation on this ECG. Now, the interesting thing is that the entire family, this is a nice family, actually, they all kind of had a, a vaccine party and everybody received the same vaccine on the same day. And so the interesting thing is that this 22-year-old patient has an identical twin. Now, the twin did not come to the emergency department because he said that uh, he um, is not a, you know, sort of a, 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 a complainer. Uh, so it turns out he actually had also chest pain, but he said that he's not like his brother, you know, will actually chicken out and go to hospital. And so the nice thing is that the emergency doc and the physician looking after the 22-year-old uh, asked the other brother to come in and to be checked. In fact, he had exactly the same ECG changes, identical troponin rise, uh, echocardiogram showed identical uh, mild LV dysfunction. It's like a yeah, mirror image of each other. And they were treated the ibuprofen, uh, cochicin, and uh, hospitalized two days, and the both uh, have uh, resolved. It really actually then shows that there is a definitive genetic predisposition uh, component right, to this, and uh, so it's really fascinating. I thought this is a wonderful story. And uh, so the last thing I'll cover is the fact that uh, as part of the recommendation of the advisors that, uh, you know, suggest that we should have a more in-depth registry uh, in addition to the uh, uh, tracking of cases by Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, using a registry to provide a deeper dive of the condition. So for this situation, any patient who's referred uh, particularly probable uh, cases, uh, then we will actually make sure we have uh, imaging, we have blood sampling, analyzing the immune uh, uh, markers, and uh, to really have a deeper dive on the uh, disease process, trying to understand it better as uh, Chuck was mentioning earlier. And so, so far, uh, uh, this is uh, of uh, about two weeks ago, we have uh, 95 cases already. And uh, most of these are, uh, uh, so they are all, uh, we use the Brighton criteria. So it's a really uh, either definitive or probable case. And you can see that this is a younger group of patients, uh, 34 year old average, uh, two thirds of males, pretty uh, typical. And uh, about 10% has autoimmune history. It's very interesting. And there's only 50% that have no prior medical history whatsoever. So when you actually do a deeper dive, you know, a number of these patients have other features to their history. And this is what we are trying to collect to see, in fact, we can come up with a predictive algorithm uh, in terms of risk. But previous COVID-19 COVID infection is actually quite unusual. So you know, a small proportion would have it, but it doesn't seem to be a predisposing factor. And uh, so the majority of cases uh, occurred after two doses, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, more than 80% have mild symptoms and are able to recover exactly as the case uh, presented. About 5% can be very severe and have hemodynamic uh, challenge. One patient went down ECMO, for example. Uh, no one, uh, you know, sort of uh, no mortality in our series so far. Uh, but uh, the very interesting thing is that about 10% of patients have this long COVID-like syndrome. Patients become so tired, they can't actually uh, go to work. Uh, you know, people, uh, they are sometimes regarded as lingerers, but in fact, they have all the symptoms that when you check off are exactly the same long COVID. In fact, I have patients who have lost their taste and smell, right? You would think that that's a classic COVID uh, symptom. Uh, 
and yes, their COVID tests are completely negative all the time, and yet they have the same COVID-like uh, uh, symptoms. And so it really shows the cross-reactivity between the two conditions and the likely driven by spike protein. And the vaccine distribution, majority, 80% are after second dose. But this is something I want to actually bring forward because this is um, something that we have seen and uh, is confirmed by the public health agency. And in fact, uh, now is affecting policies elsewhere. And that is that if you use Pfizer, Pfizer, you know, first dose, second dose as a referent, and then you compare Moderna versus uh, uh, Moderna, Moderna as two doses, uh, so even though the number of cases we have are, are identical in these groups, but if you actually look at the number of people get exposed to this combination, it means that the Moderna, Moderna combination has three times the risk of developing myocarditis compared to the Pfizer, Pfizer combination. But look at this one. If you have a Pfizer first, Moderna second, you have 25 times the risk. And that's exactly the case that you presented, right? So for some reason, this prime boost combination with Pfizer first and Moderna coming in with a huge punch, you have a huge risk of developing myocarditis. And we see you know, the severest cases in this. So this is why actually a lot of countries no longer allow Moderna to be the booster dose. And, uh, or in the US, they recommend if it comes in, it should be half dose you know, for Moderna, simply because Moderna has such a high content of mRNA. And so, you know, so this is really interesting. Whereas the second dose, is Pfizer, uh, you, that is you reverse it. You have Moderna first and you have Pfizer second, you don't see this. You know, so this is uh, fascinating. Of course, this is all hypothesis generating. This is the only pattern that we see, uh, but uh, it is uh, you know, something we're learning all the time. And certainly with AstraZeneca, you just have a scattered doses. There's no increased risk uh, easily seen. And uh, then the other thing is that uh, we see about uh, two thirds you know, uh, with abnormal MRI. MRI is quite often uh, abnormal in these patients, uh, but not everyone. Uh, similarly, uh, two thirds I've mentioned earlier have abnormal troponin, and uh, but not everyone because there are patients, you know, with a positive MRI, positive echo that don't have uh, elevated MRI uh, troponin. And uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, where we see that. The, but the, the pattern of MRI seems to be quite similar to the regular myocarditis, and uh, so there are cases in which is picked up by troponin, but not MRI or the other way around. And so the um, Brighton, uh, you know, sort of uh, requirement of having both MRI and troponin uh, gets down to only about 25% of cases, you know, so not everybody has both uh, being positive. So just uh, then uh, in conclusion, then uh, inflammatory heart reaction associated with these mRNA COVID vaccines do occur. It's more common in young men, especially following the second dose, very consistent pattern. And based on current data, it's occurs still at the relatively low frequency. The general estimation is about uh, you know five to six per hundred thousand, uh, which is uh, uh, you know not very high. But on the other hand, for younger men in their say twenties and thirties, uh, the risk actually you know goes up to about uh, twenty. You know, so it really actually increases uh, and anywhere between three to five times that general population. And uh, over 80% will recover without incidence. Small proportion will actually become ser serious ill. And as I mentioned, about 1% will actually succumb to the condition, uh, likely, you know, along with other comorbidities. And uh, the, um, uh, but the risk of SARS-CoV-2 cardiac complications, including myocarditis, is still higher than vaccine-induced myocarditis. So it's still uh, worthwhile to receive the vaccine. Uh, but on the other hand, there may be situations in which uh, the risk versus benefit may shift. And so it's interesting that uh, I think uh, Israel is not actually vaccinating, you know, sort of the five to 11 year old uh, at the moment, uh, as long as the ambient risk for SARS-CoV-2 is relatively low. And so it's very, very uh, interesting, you know, so, and, uh, and I think um, Denmark as well, you know, is not uh, actually offering it. So I think it has to do with obviously the balance of risk versus benefit. And I think ongoing monitoring uh, is gonna be critical. And uh, of course, you know, this is particularly relevant uh, in the uh, pediatric population uh, who is uh, being uh, uh, likely, you know, uh, vaccinated uh, both uh, in the US and Canada uh, uh, very shortly. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for the wonderful invitation and uh, sharing some of the learnings. And I think we're all learning uh, all these uh, 
uh, together, you know, uh, for all these new conditions. And uh, so thanks again, uh, uh, Chuck, uh, for the uh, ability, you know, to share this uh, with the many friends. And this is certainly a privilege. Um, thank you so much, Peter. That, that was a, a, a wonderful overview and uh, brings us up to date on this important subject. I, I, and I, there is actually a, a question here from Dr. Rewa that maybe you, you, you'd be willing to address. Um, 